Hi, my name is Stefan. My avatar is Freya, and I've been working on the Second Life project for our iGEM team. What you will see today is an informal discussion about some implications, some ethical implications of synthetic biology, which I will be filming. So find a comfy chair and enjoy. Hello, and welcome to our first Second Life ethics conference. So to start things off, we'll just have a round of an introduction. So my name is Mandy and I was part of the Second Life sub-team on the University of Calgary iGen team. So uh, my avatar's name is Oval Team. My avatar's name is Jeremiah and I was part of the lab and marketing aspects of the UFC iGEM team. My real name is Jeremy Kubik, and now I'll pass it over to Jamie. Uh, my name is Jamie. Thank you, Jeremy, for the introduction. My avatar's name is Blue Bull, and I helped out on the lab and marketing side of the University of Calgary 2009 iGEM team. And here's Emily. Hi, I'm Emily. My avatar's name is Echix, and I was part of the lab and human practices. And then we have Prima. Hey, my name is Prima, and my avatar's name is Cynthia. I was part of the lab, and my name is Cynthia. All right, so as a topic for our first conference, we will be discussing the article named A Life of Its Own, Where Will Synthetic Biology Lead Us? by Michael Spector, which was published recently in The New Yorker. So first off, let's talk about some general opinions or what we got from this article. Uh, the most important, um, interesting thing for, for me was to I guess sort of look at the comparison of synthetic biology and how this could, I guess, lead to um, genetic modifications in people. I've kind of looked at both of these things but never really connected them together. So that was interesting for me. What about you, Jeremy? Well, Mandy, when I before reading this paper, I'm uh, very much support synthetic biology, but this made me think about the potential negative aspects that it has um, that we need to be aware of when we move forward in synthetic biology. And um, what I thought really interesting was the case of being able to create artificial life. So that's my initial opinion. And now I'll pass it over to Jamie. Um, so my initial thoughts on the paper was that it provided a very futuristic view of where synthetic biology could take us. It provided a lot of examples on the current and projected applications of synthetic biology, such as Craig Venter and the minimal genome, and how that can in turn uh, apply to kind of designer babies. So it's something it correlated bacteria to kind of real daylight and how developments in prokaryotic work can relate to human uh, advancements. So I found that very interesting in connecting the two. So from here, I think uh, Prima has some thoughts that she wants to share. Prima? Um, for me, I, actually, I was always supportive of synthetic biology, but uh, basically it's given me a lot of the opportunity to kind of see what could be done with synthetic biology and how it could be used in real life and the potential negative applications that um, it will impact that it may have. Um, for example, I thought um, the point that you So as you've probably got the impression from, our conference is mainly based on a sort of roundtable discussion versus 
of guest speakers. So this way we're going to have a more, I guess, unstructured flow. We'll see how the topic, uh, where it brings us. Because um, that's probably how we're going to run a lot of discussion type things when we don't have uh, experts in topics. And it's a lot more of a comf comfortable setting to invite other people or out, I guess you'd say outsiders in to discuss their feelings. So to start off, um, one of the statements in the article is that for the first time God has competition and this statement is quite powerful. So what do the rest of you think about this statement? Do you think that synthetic biology is a player against God or that um, working in synthetic biology allows you to do godlike things, for example, the design of new life. Um, that's, that's an, an interesting, interesting point that you bring up, Maddie, and I actually thought about this too, because there's a quote in there where it says, we simply do not have to accept what nature has given us. While I do agree with this quote, I think it needs to be put into context in that simply we can't um, we, we still have to work within the limits set by nature and that we still have to work with single genes and just simply rearranging them. So we can change the order, but we're not at that point where we're able to predict protein structure and relate that to protein function. So we're not able to design specific proteins to do specific tasks. What we are able to do though is take a protein function and link say two different proteins of different functions and use those two together to create a common or one united outcome. So in that fact, we're able to, in a way, supersede God in rearranging genes, but we're still not direct competition with God, seeing as that we aren't able to create genes of ourselves. So yeah, any other opinions? Anything else to add? So I think, um, one of the major points, I guess, of this article was discussing, you know, the, the, the benefits of synthetic biology and the worries that come with it. Are we playing God? Are we going too far? And the, this, uh, I guess, contrast in opinion is very much articulated in one of the ethical frameworks we explored, which Emily can go over. So there was two main frameworks that we looked at for ethics. We looked at the coactionary framework. We view synthetic biology as something inherently good and it has a lot of benefits that it can offer society. On the other hand, we also looked at the precautionary frame framework, which views synthetic biology as something that has benefits, but also has the, the possibility for a lot of harms. So from the from the precautionary framework, most of the ethical interventions are in the form of regulation, trying to make up rules to try to slow progress down in a way that will be safer. Whereas ethical interventions from the other framework, the precautionary framework, are more about public education, trying to get the public on board. So, now we've explored, I guess the two frameworks, we can bring up another issue that uh, usually op opposing sides come into conflict to. So we learned about Drew Andy 